don't worry about what other people are thinking. The most successful people in the world, they're doing what they want to do and they're not necessarily worrying about what other people are thinking. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. On the show today, I had the opportunity to talk to one of my best friends of all time, Brian Friedman, who I'd met on his first day at SUNY Binghamton when I was a junior and he was a freshman the summer of 1994. He tried out for the jazz band as this hot young drummer from Long Island. I'll never forget the moment. You know, there were work buddies, there were colleagues, there were friends, and then there were lifers the non-biological family members who stick by you through thick and thin. These are the relationships where you know each other better than you know yourselves, and the idea of, may our secrets die with us, really does underscore your love and trust for one another. Brian pretty much lived my cancer diagnosis and treatment with me firsthand during the entire time in the spring of 1996 as one of my anchor friends who, unlike some other folks, did not abandon me. Rather, he doubled down, he stood by my side, was there for me, and when necessary, and I mean this, held my head over the toilet when I was puking uncontrollably from radiation therapy. Brian's a true renaissance man. He continually reinvents himself with an audacious self-awareness about fear and failure and regret that's driven him to achieve incredible things against the odds and inspire me along the way. The man's a rock, the man's a mensch, I had two best men at my wedding, and he was one of them. Need I say more? Please enjoy my conversation with one of my best friends on the planet, Brian Friedman. Brian Friedman, one of my literally oldest and dearest friends of all time. One of the two best men, I guess, can you have two best, best best-ish men at my wedding? Just to set the framework for the listeners of how important this conversation is going to be today, how how relevant it is for me to share the people that have been so supportive and anchors in my life. Everyone needs an anchor. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on Out of Patience. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time coming, for real. I've seen you go through many iterations of Matt. And it's kind of like the Apple stuff where they're like, this is the most powerful computer yet, you know, and it's like, this is the best version of Matt. So, you know, you're always growing and expanding your own universe. So it's, it's cool to be here. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me. Let's, uh, let's have a good chat. Yeah. I want to start with the value of friendship and I find myself in maybe unique or maybe not unique position. I have a lot of really incredible friendships but not too many. And you find the right stride with the right people. And we say the flower sifts over the years and I'm 46 and I don't need any new friends at this point. And yet we still have these legacy relationships going back to the stone age of what was Mm -hmm. it? 1994 that I think we first met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's tell that story. How did we meet? We met uh, I think it was a Tuesday, oh, if I'm not mistaken. You're getting really granular. <laughs> because I always recall it being like, I met two of my best friends in my life on the second day of undergrad, like real undergraduate studies. So I do think it was a Tuesday. It was the first week of classes at Binghamton University. I was a freshman in 94. And uh, I came in to audition for the jazz ensemble as a drummer. And um, I remember that day very, very clearly. Uh, I, you know, look, I had been studying drums my entire life since I was six. I, for a while, wanted to be a professional drummer. I was all county, all state, you know, in New York, they have NISMA, all that stuff, Scamia, which is Suffolk County. Like I had all those, you know, little accolades. And so I was ready to come in and kick some butt in this audition. And I'll never forget Al Ham, who is the, you know, esteemed band leader and, 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 and head of the jazz department. He asked me, we played, I think we played a real fired up version of Spain really, really fast. And he had asked me if I had read, seen the tune before, that arrangement of it. And I was like, no, I've never seen this before. It was almost like I pissed him off 
because I played it. I played it pretty well, but I was I was ripe for you know having that seat in that ensemble even as a freshman. So I met you. I met Mike Van Allen that day, and the two of you guys have gone on to really be you know two of my absolute lifelong best friends. And so that happened the second day of classes for me. Going back to that, my my first year at Binghamton, I had my ass handed to me by the music department because I came in as this hot-headed pianist guy who knew all this classical music and all this Billy Joel and Hollywood and Broadway music. And like then I met Michael Van Allen, who we mentioned before. And Mm -hmm. he like he was he's the jazz pianist. And I had Mm -hmm. we didn't use the word FOMO back then or jelly Mm. back then. But I was like, my (laughs) God, I am the smallest fish in this big pond on my first day at Binghamton. Did you have that sense too? Um, I, I was nervous, but I knew that if there was one thing I was really good at, I was, it was playing the drums. Um, the cool thing though, was that I remember meeting Jason Isaac and Dan Sieber and everybody was really cool. Nobody was like, you know, I think I can't, I was nervous, but I was humble. I didn't come in as a hot shot. I don't think I've had that feeling. I felt very welcome right away. And it was a good environment. It wasn't like, it's not like we were going to like, you know, North Texas, the University of North Texas or Miami University or Indiana, where it's like, you're really cutthroat competing with these guys. I think that, this, you know, our, our college was proficient for music, but it wasn't really a place where you would go to, you know, try to get the top seat because you wanted to get into a band or sign a recording contract, you know, while you're a, a junior you know, kind of like in sports where you would go and, you know, you want to get signed to the NFL while you're in college. I don't think it was that type of environment, which made it even better. Yeah. I mean, this entire episode is practically an advertorial for Binghamton University. We had so much fun there. The school was so kind to us. You took full advantage of everything it had to offer, as did I. I mean, you ran, you booked just again to let our listeners know, you you were like 18 or 19 and you booked like top jazz talent to come to the the music center. What was that thing that you ran? You ran the whole jazz event program or something? Yeah. Well, it was called Harper Jazz Project. And basically it was like student association funds got allocated to various groups. So we had a budget, I think it was around $10,000, which isn't really, it's not a lot, but it's also not a little. If you're able to put on shows and break even on those shows, you can put on as many shows as you wanted. You had that to spend. So we had a budget and I did the math on certain performers and you know calculated expenses and ticket prices. And as long as we came close to breaking even, I could put on as many shows as I wanted. So um, we started with Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. They were super duper hot at that time. They're still a hot band, but for college students, they were like everything. And they were in our price range and they came to the Waters Theater. And that was the first show that I had ever put on and it was sold out and it was a great event. Um, I did that for three years and then I actually was elected to the VPUP, Vice President of University Programming, where I had a much larger budget and could bring in like bigger acts. Um, So I stopped doing the jazz and I started to do some of the larger acts. We did LL Cool J. And we did the Indigo Girls when I was there. You did like one big event in the fall and one one big event in the spring. And all those events did really well. I mean, they were like, those are dream come true days, you know, to be able to like hang and work with these guys. I mean, as in the jazz area, we did Bela twice. I did Chick Corea, which was like one of the greatest days of my life. We did Joshua Redman. We did Spyro Gyra. And, uh, a few others. Afterwards, the following year, they brought in Pat Metheny, which was incredible. So we brought a lot of really good acts to school. And um, people came from Syracuse, from, you know, the Cornell area, Ithaca, Geneseo, you know, most of like the Western New York SUNY schools we would advertise to and people would come. Those were big events. It was great. It was a great, great, great time. And it actually really was like the diving board for me to you know, launch my career, even though like I really wanted to work in the music industry. When I graduated college, I could not find 
a job that was desirable for me in the music industry. So I still stayed in the entertainment industry and went into the, uh, the comedy management world, which was a bit bizarre and not necessarily what I had set out to do, but it was a good job and it was an entertainment field and it was on Long Island, which is rare. And I stayed with that for over a little over nine years. Let me jump in for a sec because I want to I want to just go back to reinforce something that just hearing you say that sounds like it was someone else that I didn't know that did this. But at age 18, 19, 20, you brought Bela Fleck, LL Cool J, Josh Redman, Spyro Jarra, Pat Metheny, Chick Corea to college. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put that in perspective at like, the things that teenagers could do, mm -hmm. early 20 somethings could do at the time. You never expected that to be what became of your undergraduate coming in as a drummer. It's a fair statement. You're absolutely right. Um, I think my enthusiasm for jazz immediately attracted me to the people in the community that were really into it. So, you know, if you if you have enthusiasm for really anything, people want to share in your enthusiasm and vice versa. So you just attract these people to you. You know, I mean, it's everyone has their story and their own. I would say, you know, you're everyone's on their own journey. So I was just fortunate that I started to meet the right people. And there was a guy who was running that Harper jazz program. And I met him at the radio station and he was graduating. He's like, you know, you, you might be really good for this. So I took it over as a sophomore because he was graduating. So basically when I was, yeah, whenever, you know, so 94, 95. Yeah. So I was 19 when I, when I brought Bela and all those guys. And then actually the following year, I leveraged that to be Winton Marsalis's intern at Jazz and Lincoln Center in the summer of 1996. That was a really big deal um, because I was able to leverage my experience as a you know kid. I don't even remember how I got that internship. I probably just looked online. Um, or, I mean, I don't even know if Back that when was you how could we do were that. looking. Back when you yeah, could right. just do that. Or maybe it was in the Sunday Times, there was an ad. Witten needs help. Something. <laughs> yeah, like it, it definitely would have been Netscape Navigator because I think that was the only thing that, the only browser that we had had or Explorer. But I remember the library had Netscape, Netscape Navigator. Um, yeah, I wound up just, you know, a lot of it is just leveraging um, and, you know, I mean, you talk about pivoting, which I know you want to talk about, but it's, it's sort of like just leveraging your previous experiences. It's like anything, you know, you just kind of, you attain a level, you reach a level, and then other levels come into view. And another example of that was the following year in 97, I managed to land a job working for a jazz agency uh, Joel Chris, who's a, a very dear friend of mine, um, hired me to work in his office over the summer. And he hired me to then go and travel the United States with the jazz drummer Roy Haynes as his road manager, which was like, I mean, it was, you know, again, you're in dream, you're in dream territory. Basically, I got to you know, travel the United States with this band, drag all their gear all over the place, set up Roy's drums, settle, you know, settle money, deal with all that stuff. I was like 20 and dealing with all that stuff. It was, that was a lot of fun. You know, it's like you just, they're building blocks. You know, everything you do is, you know, is a building block for, for the next thing. And I think that college really, really set me up to do a lot of things in my career. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, 
twice monthly coaching calls, co workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So I want to talk about something that's near and dear to both of us. It's driven us, it's carved our canyons, and it's something that everyone can relate to. And that's just abject failure. And what do you do with that? Because you don't plan for it. And how do you learn from it and not get sucked in and stuck there? So people know my stories of failure, and I consider it like falling with style and you just keep being persistent and figure it out. But in your case, yeah, you're in entertainment, you're in music and jazz. That's a very mercurial, you know, often no ceiling to even aspire towards because you're under the mercy of a just a ridiculous system. Talk to me more about what it was like for you post-college, in your 20s, getting all your shit together, so to speak, or you thought, and then boom, here you are at the nadir of your what you think is your best you. You know, I want to go back to one of the things that I had mentioned briefly, and that was my uh, desire to either be a drummer or be in the music industry. And I chose out of fear not to pursue professional drumming. And as time went on, that stayed in the, in the back of my mind as a potential regret. So my version of failure is not so much that I tried something and failed. My, the driving force within me was always the fear of regret. And so when I reached a certain point at the comedy management company and I realized, A, it wasn't really for me. I didn't have that kind of attitude or cutthroat business acumen to really be successful. And B, that I wasn't going anywhere at my particular job, that it caused me to take a look at what the alternatives were for me. And I still was in that space of I'm not sure that drumming is the right career path for me. However, by then I had started to take pictures. And I mean, I've been taking pictures since a kid, but I really loved it. I was good at it. I would stay up really late at night learning about it. This is when digital was was really starting to 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 come to come around in a professional realm. The dawn of the megapixel. Yeah. I mean, and we the cameras were really crappy when we first started. I mean, they were just a joke. But but you were fascinated by them because you hadn't seen anything like that. You, you know, when, you know, I remember the first, you know, digital camera that I had was a Canon it looked like a small cereal boxes that they have at hotels. <laughs> yeah. Like that was like the size yeah. of it basically. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it was a gift from uh, Ray Romano actually gave it to me. And uh, cause somebody gave it to him and he's like, you know, here, you want this? You know, probably something like that. <laughs> Good impression. <laughs> but it was like, Oh my God, you know, cause I, I was like, I wasn't going to go out and buy one and so on and so forth. So that really was like the first little digital. I still have it somewhere. But um, I started to educate myself, self-start. I had no burnout. I feel a great, much greater sense of burnout in my mid-40s than I did in my mid-late 20s. I think a lot of listeners might relate to that. And so I was like, this is what I want to go for. Um, The things that I didn't necessarily love about drumming were not as, uh, they weren't hurdles for me in photography because as a drummer, you're a part of an organization, you're relying on a band member, you're relying on a publicist. As a photographer, you could really go and just create your own work and your own destiny and it, it was really on you. And I, for some reason, that just was, seemed to like a, like a better, a safer bet for me to just like, you know, handle my own stuff and not be relying on a group of people. Going back to the fear, regret, failure, because I was with you all the time. I mean, oh, yeah. and you, you really struggled with the fear and the risk of 
maybe for, for not having to regret a choice you didn't know you could make. And you wrangled with, do I just quit this and start this? And how do you mm-hmm. do this and build this? And you really hustled your ass to un- go did. under every piece of concrete, lift every stone, go through every forest log and look for the things that would give you the self-confidence to just be the tipping point to say, I'm out, I'm starting this, I own the risk, I will not have regret. Yeah, I did. I, I When I was taking like, you know, side hustle gigs, even then side hustle wasn't even a term, you know, it was just like, what are you doing on your, in your free time? That was what, you know, that's now what a side hustle Moonlighting, right? Moonlighting. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a better word. People would hire me and I was making a decent amount. I would make a, a weekly salary in one day, you know, and I'm like, wow, I'm like, I, I can do this. I will search and search and search and get gigs. And it worked. But it came to a screeching halt because we need to recall the time that this was. 2007. That was when I left my job. And what happened in, in, in the fall or in the middle of 2007? You had the housing crisis. You, the, the entire economy collapsed. So all these gigs that I were doing, especially in the corporate realm, all that stuff went away. So it was, it reminds me of now. I mean, I've talked to people about, you know, where, you know, how to weather this storm because I, I did. And like many of your listeners in their own way, I'm not the only one dealing with this. We were around when the housing crisis tanked the economy. So all that corporate work immediately dried up and it was a very, very, very hard time for me. I was very depressed, especially during the winter living in New York. It was horrible. Somehow, some way I made it work. And I weathered all of those storms. I still have those times. And I've had those times all over my career. I mean, now is an anomaly um, in that, you know, the, the photography industry is, is really not in, in good shape. Certainly, the event photography business is, is a mess. But going back to what you were saying, I feel like, you know, for me, it wasn't a failure because I, with, with the drumming because I never really did it. I didn't go for it. I didn't fail at drumming. I just didn't allow myself to even fail at it. That was the the driving force for me to realize, okay, I'm not going to, you know, you're lucky if you find one thing in your life that you're passionate about. You're really lucky if you have two things. So for me, the photography was that second thing. And I didn't want to regret it. And that was why I was like, I have no choice but to pursue this and see where it goes. Because otherwise, I'll probably be miserable and unfulfilled for the rest of my life. So let's fast forward to today. I'll just throw this out as an aside, just for fun. We both had COVID, as if we didn't have enough in common already after 25 years of friendship. But what lessons, if any, did you learn from the housing crisis precedent being in the service industry to how that was applied to today? I feel like Is it even possible to think that you had embedded life hacks that you could just leap into motion right away at the get-go? Or was it really just touch and go, oh my God, this is different. What do we do now? I mean, for one, you have to live within your means, um, which is, which everyone lives at the top of their means. I don't get me wrong, but you know, you want to like, for me, like I pay every credit card bill in full when they're, you know, when they're due, it's on auto pay. Like I don't, for me, like the accrual of debt would, would have destroyed me psychologically. Um, because I have like anxieties over money. That's probably like the one big thing for me is I have money anxiety. So I didn't let like throughout this whole time, I haven't let my bills lag. I always put the uh, proper amount of money aside for taxes. You know, I don't, I don't wait until the end of the year to like have to get a couple of big gigs and then just write a big check. So I, I, you know, fortunately now, you know, my, my wife, Kayla, has her job and you know we're we're okay but had that not been the case i still would have gone into this with a above board i would have been in the black i would not have had other than like a housing debt or you know a car payment you know those are certain debts that a lot most people have because you didn't pay cash for your house or you didn't pay cash for your car that's a goal but other than that there's i don't have any debt so that was I've been doing that my whole career. I didn't, if I didn't have it, I didn't buy it. 
you know, was, was always certainly when you wanted a lens, you know, a, a 24 to seven, two, eight lens is a $3,000 lens. You don't buy that lens unless you have the money in your account and you know, you're going to, you're going to use that lens to make more money. So I think that though, you know, you have to, you have to resist getting the toys, you know, even before you and I were talking, like, I want to start recording my drums, but I need a good couple of grand to do that. Right now, I need to resist the temptation to do that because it's not a wise choice. It's not a it's not a wise use of the of the money that I have at a time where income is not flowing nearly as it were a year ago. So those lessons, I, I feel like be of above and beyond what you can do in business. I just think in your own personal life and your own personal finances, you gotta live with don't you can't stretch yourself. And and the worst thing you want to do is have like credit card debt has always been like, you know, like the kryptonite to me. I'm never gonna have credit card debt. I'm never gonna put myself into that position. And luckily, you know, and I spend crazy amounts of money in my business, just like you do. I mean, stuff is expensive, um, but I never got into a position where I, I was spending more than I was coming in. Do you have briefly any quick life hack recommendations for any listeners that are in the service industry? I think I just gave you the, the life hack you know, for me was just, you know, allocating and putting money aside. I, the most times where I, I hear from my friends at the end of the year is, I don't know how I'm going to pay this tax bill because people don't chop up their paycheck and put it aside in a separate bank account that's tied to your other account. I mean, I have like a checking, I have a business and a checking savings, excuse me, a business checking and a business savings. So I move money into savings. I don't touch it. And then when I need to pay the bill, I, I literally move it back into my checking account. You know, so I feel like for me that, you know, unless you're okay living with that kind of debt, for me, that's just not, you know, it's just not something I want to go to sleep with knowing that I have a mountain of debt. That's my, that's just my anxiety. I feel like too, and this is something that I'm working on currently is, yeah, I mean, you know, what's funny, Matt, is like, I do have self-confidence issues. I do. I know that I do because there are certain things that I hold myself back from doing because of what I think other people will think of it. And if I can go back to my younger self and work on that as a teenager, I wish I, that's sort of the, the advice that I would go back to, you know, as, as, a, as a younger self would be, don't worry about what other people are thinking. You know, the, the, the most successful people in the world are not worrying. They're just, they're doing what they want to do and they're not necessarily worrying about what other people are thinking. It's been exacerbated by social media. There's no question about that. I mean, because we go on and we post to get the gratification, but we're also then just, I look and see who's liking or who's not liking what I'm posting. And that has, that has seeped in deep. So that, that would be the caveat right there. And never the read the who comments. Are very successful, never read the comments. Yeah. But the people who are most successful now, I'm finding, are not, are exactly, are not reading the comments. And I, I have to get myself to that place. Because as you wanted to get into with the pivoting, like I'm starting to do some online learning. But I, and I know a lot of my colleagues struggle with this. I want it to be perfect. That's part of why I've never really seen my YouTube channel take off for me because I'm recording myself and putting these videos together. If it's not perfect, I walk away from it and then it just sort of like falls by the wayside. That's my issue. So, and, and all the training that I've had, and I've, I've had unbelievable training where people are, are in the same boat as me and they tell you that done is better than perfect. So, you know, that would be another little, you know, another little tidbit that I know I struggle with that I'm working on, but I see in other people that if you don't worry so much about what other people are thinking, you're going to be successful. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of nodding heads listening to the show. So uh, I, I want to close out by talking about our heroes. And some of mm. our heroes aren't always the ones we expect them to be. And some of them show up and become the heroes because bad things happen to good people. But let's take a minute to recognize our dear friend, Evangelos Dusmanos, who we both knew mm -hmm. from Binghamton University. And, um, or I, I should just call it SUNY Binghamton because I want to piss off the alumni that listen to the show. So let's, let's pay a, a quick homage to Van. Yeah, Van was the university photographer when, you know, during our tenure at school, he was 
the like one of the coolest guys ever really funny was always the fun guy he was like killer photographer from the philadelphia area was a photojournalist everybody loved him you know and and i met him early on i was introduced to him again just being in those circles of you know meeting cool people or meeting somebody who has the same interest as you van came out and started to photograph the the concerts and that was how he and I started a bond. And he was actually the one who got me into concert photography because I would look at his photos of the shows that I was promoting. And, you know, Van isn't with us anymore. He, he passed away, a, I don't know, a good 10 years ago, probably even long, it's longer than that at this point, I, sh I should know. But that's probably the hardest thing for me to, 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 to stomach is that he... I know he's looking over me and, and I, I really, 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 really owe so much of my success to him because of the things that he taught me, that he inspired me to do and be. I teach a lot of his lessons, you know, when I'm teaching or I'm giving a seminar or something, I always reference a, a couple of things that I remember him teaching me that I used to write down. And, you know, yeah, he inspired me and it without, and, and when, you know, luckily he was around when I was transitioning from the comedy industry into the photography industry, because he really had, he was really there for me. He was really an encourager and he just inspired me. He was one of those guys where he was just like, you have to do it. You, you have, you don't have a choice now. You, you said you're going to do it. You want like, you have to do it. And, and, and I'm grateful that I followed his his advice. I mean, you know, and I, I, I carry out his legacy. I try to feel, um, when I'm on a gig or, you know, I'm providing the services that I provide for people, which is hopefully to bring them happiness. Like as a photographer, one of my, you know, mission statements, my statements of purpose is to bring joy to others through photography. That was one of the things that Van showed me. He didn't even have to tell me, but that was, that's the whole goal. I mean, certain styles of photography don't lend itself to that. Okay. That's fine. You know, product photography may not lend itself to that, but you know, social photography, pictures of events and parties and concerts and headshots and things like that, you know, that the whole purpose of that is to bring joy to others. So um, Van, Van showed me that without necessarily, you know, phrasing it that way. Um, and yeah, he, Van is absolutely my, certainly my number one hero um, as far as, you know, photography goes. There's nobody, there's nobody higher in, in, in the realm of things than Van. Brian Friedman, I'll just call you a mensch, one of my best friends on the entire planet. And if our listeners want to learn more about Brian's extraordinarily, ridiculously, you know, like the Zoolander, like really, really ridiculously good looking photo journals and portfolios and services, the website is b-freed, F-R-E-E-D, bfreed.com. Bro, more to come. I love you forever. Thanks, man. Thank you. I love you back, dude. Thank you for having me, man. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.